Okay, so then let's start with the main topic for today, and this is um, asset frequency domain and time domain. And we all live in a time domain. Um, time domain, we are used to time domain, so for us it's easy to understand, right? Yesterday was yesterday, today is today, tomorrow will be tomorrow. And so if you have charging processes, if you have something that is um, where current and voltage and charge and whatnot are increasing or decreasing with time, then it's simple to understand. Um, okay, so then if you have resonance systems, like some RLC circuit, like a cavity resonator, then it's, or a filter for example, um, then it's usually more understandable to look in the frequency domain and to check how does the circuit react on different frequencies or how does your system react on different frequencies. And typically, historically, if you do measurements in the frequency domain, if you measure the spectrum of signals with a spectrum analyzer, for example, or if you analyze um, the transmission within circuits and systems or propagation of antennas with a vector network analyzer, it's usually more exact uh, to do this measurement in frequency domain. I mean, if you ask the uh, highly sophisticated measurement instrument uh, developers and suppliers, they will now tell you how ah, we can also now do very good measurements in time domain. But let's say in the frequency domain, it's, it's still, I would say, um, often more exact. Okay, so now we can, um, and this is what we will do, take a look at different disturbance signals. So we will start with very simple ones, harmonic sinusoidal systems. Then we will say, okay, the signal is still periodic, but not harmonic anymore. It will somehow replicate itself after a certain time, but it might be a rectangular pulse train, something like this, or some sawtooth signal. And then if you have, for example, lightning as a disturbance, if you have electrostatic discharge, you have single pulses. Um, so we should also look at aperiodic impulsive noise um, signals. And so some mathematical background that we need for the description is, uh, of course, we will once again deal with complex phasors for our signals. And there is this Euler's identity, so we can convert some um, exponential function with a complex argument into a sum of cosine and sine functions. So cosine is the real part, sine um, is the imaginary part, and this, the j that is in there um, is the imaginary unit, um, square root of minus one. Okay, so if we start with sinusoidal disturbances, harmonic oscillations, they are ca characterized by some amplitude, then we have some frequency, um, typically the frequency is written as an angular frequency, which is two times P times F, the usual frequency, and the usual frequency is one over the periodic time. So capital T here is the periodic time. And then um, you can have a phase angle, and phase angle only makes sense, let's say, if you have two signals and they have a phase difference to each other, or if you have um, yeah, if you have some fixed point, um, because otherwise phase does not make sense. Phase is just a reference to something else. Okay, and we can write this as a time function. Let's say assuming it's a cosine function with amplitude, angular frequency, and phase. And then you could um, also say, okay, from a mathematical point of view, it's really the same as if I would take the real part of the same amplitude of this complex exponential function, and um, then I can put the, the amplitude and the phase shift into some complex phasor. And this is what we will usually, what is usually how your complex phasor that you do in AC circuit calculation is defined. And this phasor, from my point of view, which is a typical mistake um, and, and some typical error, this phasor just this one here with the underscore because it's complex. This is now not a function of time anymore. There is no time in there. The, the time is here inside this exponential function. Um, but this phasor, of course, can be, can be a function of frequency. If you have a filter, 
your signal amplitude will change with frequency. If you have some resonance circuit, um, the amplitude and phase and so on will change with frequency. And this sinusoidal disturbance looks like this. Um, so just some cosine function. And here would be this periodic time. Here we have two periods and this is the amplitude. And here we have no phase shift. Okay, so now if we convert this into frequency domain, as discussed, there is just one phaser. So just at this particular frequency, however you scale the frequency axis, if it's frequency or angular frequency, there we have one phaser that has this particular amplitude. Okay, so uh, then we can take a look at periodic signals, but which are now non-sinusoidal anymore, like a rectangular pulse strain or like a clock signal um, if you have input and output of rectifiers and inverters, power electronic circuits, something like this. And so now there is a nice idea from some French um, engineer and mathematician, uh, Jean-Baptiste Follier, who proposed this nice idea that Okay, what we did before was, and what, what you do is in, in AC circuit simulation, is you deal with this complex phasers, and the complex phaser means there is some harmonic time function, like sine and cosine. And so now, if we could um, build and replicate, let's say, our rectangular pulse strain as a sum of sine and cosine functions, then we could use also the same theory um, for non-harmonic signals. And so he, he found out, okay, this is possible. We can take any periodic signal and approximate this as a sum of cosine and sine functions that are weighted with specific coefficients here called AK and BK. And then we take some um, infinite sum of these cosine and sine functions and they have multiples of the fundamental frequency. That's the idea. So. Um, k is just some integer number, k is counting up, and then we might need to have some offset to shift the whole function up and down. And then, of course, um, you cannot go up to infinity in this, in this sum, um, and usually these coefficients become smaller with increasing k. And then at k equals 10 or k equals 20 or maybe k equals 100 or so, this is what we can also try out in one of the exercises, then you say, okay, now these coefficients are so small, we don't care about them anymore and we somehow clip or cut this, this infinite sum. Um, so this is the mathematical way to write it down and the engineering way would be to say, okay, up to 100, up to 10, up to whatever precision you need. Okay, and so th this is nice, of course, yeah? and the, the, the price that you have to pay for this, the difficulty is if you want to calculate these coefficients AK and BK, you need to take your function that you would like to approximate and in multiply it with sine and cosine functions with these different um, multiples of the fundamental frequency and integrate them over one period of time. And we are all electrical engineering students or electrical engineers, we are now mathematicians, so we don't like to solve these integrals for sure, right? Because this is the, the difficult and hard and challenging part. Um, yeah, so we, we somehow have to deal with this and there are of course numerical ways how to do it. So we will solve it by hand for a simple example in the exercise, really on the analytical way, but of course every engineer takes a computer, takes something like MATLAB, Octave, Python, um, and then there are numerical ways to do this. A discrete Fourier transform or a fast Fourier transform. I don't know if you've heard of FFT and DFT. Um, this would be the way to do it. And this is this Jean-Baptiste Joseph Fourier guy uh, who, found about, who found out about this. Okay. And Simple example how this looks like. So if you would have, if we would have a simple rectangular pulse train uh, with a certain amplitude and 50% duty cycle, then to replicate this, we would need to have the fundamental wave with an amplitude that's, that is a bit larger. And then um, if you calculate this, you find out, okay, we need three times the frequency 
with a third of the amplitude. And if, if you would add up the um, green curve and the red curve, right here they would add up, it would get a little steeper. Um, here this is minus and this is plus, so the, the sum would look like, would look, something look like this. Um, and then, yeah, unfortunately, I kind of maybe, maybe I can um, copy this for a second. And put it into my drawing program to make it more understandable. And I need my pen. So there it is. And if we now take, for example, um, yeah, maybe, maybe this color. So if I would add up the green and the red curve, so here they would add up. Um, here, said so this is positive, this is negative, so this would go down a bit. Yeah, here they would add up, here it's, it gets a bit steeper. And here this one is positive, this one is, uh, let's say, below this line, so here we would get up a bit, go down, and it would look like this. And you can see, okay, this green curve is not yet some rectangular function, and we have just taken two of these components, the fundamental wave and the um, third, or the tr triple the frequency, uh, but it's getting into the right direction. And if I would take a different color and now also add this light blue curve, right, then it would go more steep up here. Here it would go down a bit, here it would go up, here it would go down, and we would go this way and so on and so on. So it would go down, go up, go down, go up, go down, and go up again. And then you can see, okay, we are getting closer to this rectangular pulse train. And if you would take the sevens and the nines and the elevens and so on, it would always get steeper here and you would get more flat here, it would get steeper here, would get more flat there and so on. It, it's still not working perfect. Uh, we can discuss this in the exercise because the problem is, in this example here of course, that we are, tr oops, that we are trying to replicate a function that has jumps, right? This rectangular pulse train jumps from one point to the other. Um, and this rectangular pulse train has sharp edges and sharp corners, right here and there. And we are trying to replicate this by a sum of sine and cosine functions and they are all smooth. They don't have any edges and they don't have any sharp jumps and so on. And that's why it does not work in this case perfectly, right? And that's why in this formula it's also just approximately it works, um, but in this case not perfect because it's, if you think about this, it's, it's, it's very understandable. We cannot replicate a function with sharp corners, edges, and jumps out of, out of a sum of functions that don't have sharp corners, edges, and jumps. It just simply does not work. And this is one of, the, one of the problems, one of the issues associated with this whole Fourier transform and conversion between time and frequency domain. If we look at the spectrum, and this is what we can also try to measure in uh, some minutes, you have this fundamental wave, you have the third harmonic, you have the fifth harmonic, and so on. Um, and as you can see, they go down with frequency. And then at some time you can just clip it. Um, this is the corresponding exercise task. We will talk about this in the exercise, so I will skip forward. And so then you could also write down this very same formula that we have just seen with the sine and cosine functions, the sum, as some, um, as some sum over a complex exponential function. Because remember, this Euler's identity told us the complex exponential function is the same as a sum of sine and cosine, cosine with the real part, sine with the imaginary part. And now if you, if you do some mathematical manipulation, okay, you can find out um, if you do it this way, it's the very same as before. And here 
now we have complex coefficients and we would call these complex coefficients if the other ones have been a and b now we can call them c uh, for example and if you were to calculate them you need to do the same stuff as before take your function multiply it with this um, exponential function integrate over one period of time okay so same thing as before just another way to write it down mathematically and why do we do this in preparation what is the next step and the next step is okay what what can we do for functions that are not periodic anymore um, or where let's say where the what happens if the periodic time gets very large right because then it would take a long time until the signal replicates itself and until the signal replicates itself and so the answer is already somewhere here if the periodic time gets large then we would need to integrate over a larger time um, and if the, the periodic time gets infinitely large then here we would integrate from minus infinity let's say up to plus infinity over time and but then we would somehow need to renormalize because if we also divide by infinity then it does not work okay so but that's the idea of um, a Fourier series here is just the way how this fits to what we said before how these AK and BK coefficients um, 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 coincide or, or um, give this complex C coefficient okay and so now for as said for aperiodic signals for signals that don't replicate after a certain amount of time just single impulsive disturbances and noise what we do is not a Fourier series we do a Fourier transform so as said we take the signal multiply it with this complex exponential function integrate um, from minus infinity until plus infinity or at least over the time where the signal exists and then we get the complex spectrum of the signal so this is the conversion from time domain into frequency domain and then you can also do it the other way around from frequency domain into time domain it's a similar calculation you take the complex spectrum once again multiply it with some complex exponential function also integrate from uh, minus to plus infinity over all your frequencies and um, yeah convert by this factor and then you get back your time function so the time function as said is in here or the spectrum that we calculate is in here so this way these two formulas are connected with each other forward conversion into frequency domain and, and um, conversion back into time domain and then if you look into the literature um, you will find many different factors here in front so sometimes so here we have a factor of one here here we have one over divided by 2p or 2 pi and you will also find something with 1 over the square root of 2 pi here 1 over the square root of 2 pi here and vice versa and this is that there are different definitions different conventions um, if this is an amplitude spectrum if it's a power spectrum it's of course it just changes and scales these spectrum um, the spectrum up and down and yeah once again calculating these integrals here is very hard and challenging and there are not so many um, functions where you can really do it so in practice in real life what most people do is using this FFT and inverse FFT uh, and this is the abbreviation for fast Fourier transform and the fast Fourier transform um, is a special way of a discrete Fourier transform so the discrete Fourier transform is you simply replace this integral by a sum um, and then still if you so we, we don't take many many small steps and integrate over an infinite number of infinitesimal small steps but we take a finite sum over finite steps and if you do this with a computer of course it's quite a challenging task for a computer um, at least it has been 
And so uh, lots of clever mathematicians um, thought about how to speed up this process and they came up with this fast Fourier transform. So the fast Fourier transform is a special way of this discrete Fourier transform and it only works for if your time steps or if the frequency steps that you put inside this FFT if this is a power of 2. So for example if you have 16 or 32, 64, uh, 128, 256, and so on and so on. And in this case, this uh, fast Fourier transform is especially fast. This is what what uh, what the fast means. Okay, um, if you ever visit Paris and if you are at the Eiffel Tower, um, there are, I think, a total something like 40 names or so. Um, and Fourier is one of the names also printed on the Eiffel Tower to honor his work. Oops. Okay, and there's an exercise task related to this. We will also, this is the most simplest example that you can think of. Um, interesting. Um, so you, you, you take the single uh, rectangular pulse. This is what we will do in the exercise. And so if you then take a look at how the spectrum of such a single pulse looks like, it looks like this. So. Um, we have lots of spectral, so there's a, there's a DC part, we have lots of spectral content for low frequencies and then also the higher you go in frequency, um, the, the less amplitude spectrum you have, usually. Um, and what we can also see, it's a continuous spectrum. Now before we had single discrete frequencies inside the spectrum. For the harmonic function we had just one frequency, for the rectangular pulse strain we had the fundamental frequency and multiples of them, and here if you have um, a single pulse, if you calculate this Fourier transform, you get a continuous spectrum. So the spectrum contains all frequencies, let's say. And what is also interesting is um, yeah, so the pulse here has some pulse width that I call tau and it has some amplitude. And of course, the higher the amplitude, the higher the spectrum. Um, if you take a, if, if this is, this is to be honest, some, some yeah, spectral density would be better. So um, this means it's proportional to the energy. And so if you have a higher amplitude or a longer pulse, it means there is more energy in this pulse. So the, um, the spectral density here is, depends not only on the amplitude but also on this pulse width because of the energy. B but what I would also like to mention here, you have some first null, some first zero crossing in the spectrum. This is at 2 pi over tau and the next one is at 4 pi over tau and so on. So this means if you have a shorter pulse, if you have a smaller tau, right, if you have some, if we would have some clock signal that switches on and off faster or, nah, I mean in this case it's not replicating. So but if you have, if you have a shorter pulse in time domain, you switch something on and off very quickly, then if this goes smaller, if the tau gets smaller, then of course this fraction gets larger. So you shift this to higher frequencies. So it means if you have something short in time domain, then it will be very broad in frequency domain. If you have something that is very short in time domain, it will contain lots of frequencies. Um, and if you have something that is very slow in time domain, changing very slowly, then it will contain only very small frequencies in frequency domain. Right? Um, and if you have this, um, yeah, just a periodic change in time domain, harmonic change in time domain, then it will be also very, yeah, so if you have a sinusoidal, cosinusoidal function in time domain that starts at minus infinity and ends at plus infinity and that always does like this, going um, sinusoidally up and down, then in, in, in your frequency domain it will be just a single line in the spectrum. So what is short in time domain will be brought in frequency domain and vice versa. 
That's uh, some important thing. And so now we take this, this is what we will calculate in the exercise. Now we will take this function and just um, show it in a different way. And uh, as discussed in our decibel exercise, we will do a logarithmic scaling on this axis and we will do a logarithmic scaling on this axis. So convert this amplitude, let's say, in dB and also scale this frequency axis in a logarithmic way. And then this, this is, um, th does any one of you see what type of function this is here? Have you seen such a function before that has this shape? And maybe it could also go down here and go up and go down and go up, but because I've just plotted the, the magnitude, the absolute value, of course, it cannot be negative anymore. Say, say again. Yeah, it's some sinus x over x function or sinus frequency divided by frequency. And so the sinus will do this going up and down and going up and down. And the one over frequency will do that it goes down with frequency. The amplitude goes down with frequency. And so if we plot the very same function in this double logarithmic scaling, it looks like this. So uh, we have some constant part and then we have this going up and down and going up and down and going up and down from the sinus function. And we have this um, that the amplitude goes down with frequency. And you can see that if we have a certain, um, if we would have a certain amplitude here, for example, yeah, if I would draw a line following all these things, I have a certain amplitude here. Um, and if I increase the frequency by a factor of 10, so going from here to here, my amplitude would also go down by a factor of 10, which perfectly makes sense. And so now in EMC, we are not really interested in all these going up and down and going up and down. We are interested in the worst case. So what, what, what is the worst case that might happen? So we say, okay, here it's staying constant, here it's going down. We, we just take the, the envelope, let's say, of this function, the maximum of this function. Um, and even if your, uh, this is a nice XKCD comic. It's one of the very first ones. Um, yeah, so even if you don't have a rectangular pulse and look at the spectrum of this, but anything else, a lightning pulse, um, an ESD pulse, a meow of a cat, and if you take the Fourier transform, it will always somehow look like this, that you have some, some peaks, some spikes in there, you have some frequencies where you have more spectral content, and then you have frequencies where there's less spectral content, and, yeah, and so the meow, if you take the meow of a cat um, converted into frequency domain, it, it might really look something like this. Okay, and so um, next step is let's assume that we don't have a rectangular pulse. Let's assume that we have some trapezoidal pulse. So the pulse set has not, not only a pulse width, but also a rise time. And with this trapezoidal pulse, if the rise time would be very sh short, very small, then it would turn into a rectangular pulse. If the rise time gets very long and very slow in comparison with the pulse width, then we would get a triangular pulse. And so this is some more general way to uh, write down these pulses. And if you have power electronic circuits, if you have pulse, uh, clock sickness, somewhere on a printed circuit board. I, I think most of the pulses that you find in your daily life, you can approximate as one of these pulses here, or with one of these pulses, given by a pulse width and some rise time and some amplitude, of course. And so for this, because of the rise time and the fall time, it's a bit more challenging to calculate the Fourier transform. Still, it's doable, uh, but we don't do it in the exercise because it's just writing down three or four pages of equations. But if you do it, you get something like this. Um, and I said, this is just the envelope. So in reality, it would go down and go up and go down and go up and go down and go up as before, as we have seen. But now we just look at the env envelope. And what happens there is that at low frequencies, you get a constant part. 
until you have 1 over p and the pulse width. And then you get minus 20 dB per decade Oops. and uh, minus 20 dB for some, for some amplitude means a factor of 10 as we discussed. This is like a root power quantity. So um, if you have 10 times the frequency, your amplitude goes down by a factor of 10, as we have just seen before. And then there will be a second corner frequency. So here we had the first corner frequency or back frequency. There will be a second corner or back frequency. And the second uh, frequency depends on the pulse, on the rise time of the pulse. And from there, we will go down with minus 40 dB per decade. And this is how the amplitude spectrum will look like of such a trapezoidal pulse. And it's, it's a very handy tool because you just need to know the amplitude of the pulse, the pulse width, and the periodic time. And here you also need the pulse width, and then you can draw the spectrum by hand. And you don't need to do complicated mathematical calculations. You can just um, take an oscilloscope, measure your pulse, and from this um, determine, as said, amplitude, pulse width, rise time, and then sketch the spectrum and have some idea what, what is the spectral content inside this pulse. And as said, the outcome is if you have a rectangular pulse, as looked at before, there is almost no rise time. Rise time is very short, so if this is very short, this second break frequency will move to higher frequencies. Um, for the trapezoidal pulse, you have two break frequencies. And for this triangular pulse, the pulse width is the same as the rise time. If we look at this here, let me close the door. Yeah, you, can, you can see that um, in this definition, if we have a triangular pulse, pulse width and rise time, because the pulse width here is measured at the um, half of the amplitude. So for triangular pulse, it will look like this. Two, the two break frequencies, two corner frequencies are at the very same point. And so maybe last thing to discuss before we do some experiment is, um, so if we would assume that our source, for example, some power electronic circuit creating such disturbance pulses has this spectral density, the, the blue curve that we discussed before, the very same blue curve as here. So constant at low frequencies, first corner frequency going down by one over F and the second a corner frequency and then going down by one over F squared, corresponding to the um, minus 20 minus 40 dB per decade that we discussed. And so then usually, this is we will, what we will discuss in one of the next um, lectures, the coupling increases with frequency. If you have capacitive coupling, um, it increases with frequency. If you have inductive coupling, it increases with frequency, proportional to the frequency. Because um, if you, yeah, what, what is the law of induction? Induced voltage is equal to the time derivative of the magnetic flux. And if you convert this into frequency domain, time derivative in time domain corresponds to what in the frequency domain? Or if you have something like, uh, let's see if this still works. Where's my pen? Um, so if we, if we have, in time domain, if we say some, some induced voltage at some inductor, at some inductive disturbance is, is this voltage as a function of time is the same as, oops, naja, does not, does not look that nice. Yeah, so inductance times time derivative of the current. If the current changes at some inductor, some voltage is induced. 
how does this very same equation look like in a frequency domain? If I would say I want to have a complex voltage phaser here, how do I calculate the complex voltage phaser? I mean, you are all electric engineers. Maybe someone in, 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 the, in the chat knows. How does this equation in time domain look like in frequency domain? No, why, why, should I, why should I take the derivative of the angular frequency? Yeah, it's, it's j omega l. j omega l times the phasor of the current. Have you seen this equation before? Okay. You, sh you should. You study electrical engineering. It's very, very, very fundamental uh, second semester equation in electrical engineering. Uh, time derivative in time domain corresponds to a multiplication with j omega in the frequency domain. Right? L is L, current is current, voltage is voltage, but time derivative in time domain is j omega multiplication with j omega in the frequency domain. And j omega in frequency domain means our coupling increases with frequency. And so now we can discuss, okay, what, what is visible? What do we get at the sink of our disturbance, at the victim of our disturbance? And if you have a constant source and some increasing coupling, you get some increasing disturbance at the victim. If you have some decreasing source over frequency and some increasing coupling, you get something constant. And if you have um, some still increasing coupling, but your source goes down with the frequency squared, you also get a disturbance at the sink that is going down with frequency. So usually your source has a spectrum like this, like the blue curve, your coupling increases with frequency. And what you see at the victim of a disturbance looks typically looks like this red curve. At low frequencies you have no problem because there's no coupling. At high frequencies you have no problem because there is no spectral content in the source, but there is some frequency band in between where your, where, where your coupling gets maximum, or where not the coupling gets maximum, where the uh, disturbance that you see at the victim gets maximum.